we're here on Saturday, November 9th at the North Carroll Library to talk to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Ron Hollingsworth, uh, who is a member of uh, the American Legion here in, uh, in Carroll County. Uh, he and I have uh, kind of struck up a friendship there and have talked over a period of time. And Ron, we're glad you're here today to talk to us about some of your experiences in and around Carroll County and uh, in the United States Army. Uh, you were originally from uh, Carroll County here, correct? Yes, I grew up in Union Bridge. Okay. Um, graduated from Francis Scott Key High School. Matter of fact, I was in the very first class to graduate from Francis Scott Key High School. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's, uh, that was in, <coughs> what, 19 1960. 1960. <coughs> okay. Okay. So I have, still have quite a few family members here, a large family in around Carroll County. Right. Welcome right up there in Union Bridge. Okay. Outstanding. And, um, and then you went from there to, I believe, Morgan State uh, University. Yes. Uh, when I got out of high school, I didn't know what I was going to do. The job market around here wasn't much. I, so I said, well, maybe I'll think about going to college. So mm -hmm. I went off to Morgan State University. Mm -hmm. um, of course, at that time, uh, like a lot of black colleges, probably a lot of universities at the time, Morgan State had an ROTC program. Right. And all males had to take the first two years. You okay. couldn't graduate unless you took two years of ROTC. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know, fresh, freshman year, freshman, sophomore year. Mm -hmm. So I took two years of it. Mm -hmm. um, had no intentions of going in the Army. Mm -hmm. um, but I remember about my third, no, I guess it's my sophomore year. I got my third draft notice. I got a first one, freshman year in college. <laughs> and. Of course, being a little country boy from a little town like Union Bridge, I didn't know anything about college deferments or anything like that. Nobody said anything to me about it. Right. Uh, I know I, t I called my father, and my father, he said, well, when you come home, we're going to fight this. So he took me to down to the draft board, and he did all the talking. I just sitting there listening to him. He got me out of that one. Where, where was the uh, draft board? Was that, oh, you had to go all the way down to Baltimore? No, it was right there in Westminster. Oh, so, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Where was uh, that in Westminster? Uh, right there near the... Where the library is in that area, that area's kind of changed around a little bit there okay. since they built the library there. Right. That's where it was. <clears throat> um, but then when I got the second one, I went by myself. Mm -hmm. So when I got that third one, when I was a sophomore, I, what the, you guys don't even want me to get an education here. <laughs> so I was pissing and moaning, you know, college, young college student. And, uh, and one, of the RO, one of the reserve officers training officer from the Army that was teaching it. He, he said, I hear you got another draft notice. And I said, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't even want to discuss it. <laughs> anyway, so he said, well, you need to come talk to me. We can take care of that draft. If you get any more, we can take care of it. If you still got that, we can take care of that one for you. Well, what do you want? He was recruiting me. I didn't realize it. <laughs> uh, he talked to me for three or four hours. The only thing I remember him saying to this day was, you're going to be in the Army. Within six months of walking off this campus, you're going to be in the Army. You can have a choice. You can go in as a private, or if you listen to me, you'll sign up for the advanced program for two more years, and you'll go in the Army as a second lieutenant. I, I, I said, well, that makes a lot of sense. But I remember saying to him, well, if I have an option, I'd rather not go at all. But uh, he said, well, no, that's, you don't have that option. <laughs> They're going to get you within six months after you walk off this campus. <clears throat> right. So I said, let me think about it a little bit. So I did. I went back and signed up for it uh, for two more years of advanced reserve officer training. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into the Army. Right. Uh, and the bad thing about it is I got married when I was still in college, my junior year. And if, if I had known any better, because I was married, I wouldn't have had to have gone in the Army. Oh. They, weren't, they wouldn't draft you if you, were, if you were married and had any children. Oh, I didn't have goodness. any children at the time, but at least I, I got a wife about... But eight months after I signed up for reserve officer training, right. didn't discover that until I wound up in the Army. <laughs> but that's how I got in the Army. Right. Thirteen days after I graduated, I was sitting at Fort Hood, Texas, uh -huh. as a brand new second lieutenant. Right. Couldn't even find my way to the bathroom, how, but that's how, what I was. How did they uh, branch you uh, when you were there? Is that your... That's mine. That's, that's mine. Uh, well, if you were, if you became a distinguished military graduate, yeah. which I was, DMG, yeah, yeah. okay, you, you had the choice. You could pick whatever branch you wanted, right? And you had to go in for the first couple of years as a combat arms officer, no matter what branch. If you took finance or something right. like that, you, your first two years you, you spent in com one combat arms. Mm -hmm. Well, I picked field artillery. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, don't ask me why, but that's what I picked. <laughs> that's what I wound up in, is field right. artillery. Did you, uh, at, when you were there at uh, Morgan State University, did you, in the summer or anything like that, get a chance to uh, go to uh, artillery range or anything like that and actually fire? Oh, yes. Or everything? Um, I, didn't, I didn't know I was going to be a field artillery while I was still, so right. I never went to, yeah, never went to Fort Sill or any yeah. place where they had field artillery f f firing ranges, but we right. went to several different military bases. Right. Uh, went to Fort Meade, so we used to be out Fort Meade all the time. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Morgan State's right there in Baltimore. Right, yeah. Just a hop, skip, and jump down to Fort Meade. So uh -huh. we were out there all the time. Right. And Morgan State has an excellent ROTC program. So right, we yeah. were on several different military. We went to Fort Benning mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. there for about a, about a week. Right. Uh -huh. um, and then we go to Indian Town Gap up there in Pennsylvania for the ROTC summer camp. Oh, is that where summer camp was? Yeah, that's where okay. it was back then. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's how I wound up in the field artillery. That's right. what I picked. Right. So then you said you were at Fort Hood. You ended up at, at, at Fort Hood? Yes. Yeah. I went in under, under a special program where they didn't even send you to your, to your branch. You know, you, in that second, you go to a nine-week program for, for, for your particular branch of service. Right. Well, they sent me right to Fort Hood. Uh -huh. Uh, and I remember getting, when I arrived at Fort Hood, I w reported to my battalion commander in the wrong uniform. And of course, he wasn't very happy about that. Uh, and I'm trying to, he told, gave me an hour to get in the right uniform. I'll well, try to figure out what the right uniform is. Uh -huh. Fortunately, the sergeant major took, took pity on me. Right. Told me, told me what were uniform you, were you, were you in greens? Uh, or fatigues? I still remember. I think I was probably in greens. And he wanted you in fatigue. Oh, yeah. And because Fort Hood, everybody, fatigues, that's all they ever wore. It was a war-fighting post, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, but we had three, four different uniforms at the time when I got there. And I purchased them all before I even got there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I'm sitting there debating about which. But anyway, he told me which one to put on. Mm. Uh, and the battalion commander, he wasn't happy at all. He, he just got another second lieutenant who had never even been trained in field artillery. Oh, oh, so that's the reason he was, yeah, oh. right. he was going to have to OJT you there. Uh, yeah. He said, we're going to send you to the, I don't care what the Army says, we're going to send you to Fort Sill. If I have to send you up to TDY from here, temporary duty from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I stayed there for about three months and finally sent me up to Fort Sill to the field artillery training program for second lieutenants. Right. Basic course, basically. Yeah, right? basic course. Yeah. Uh, that's very, it's a very nice course. Um, and then I left there and, I, and went straight to Fort Benning to Airborne School. Mm, okay. And my wife, oh, my wife wasn't happy about that. we have been jumping out of airplanes. <laughs> <laughs> now, did she what? travel with you to Fort Hood when you went down there, or did she stay here in Oh, Maryland? no, she went with me. Okay. She, so you, yeah. I thought she was going to stay here and finish her at college, but she, she was a year behind me. She went with me. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but uh, she went with me to Fort Sill because I was up there for nine weeks. Mm -hmm. So we were up there. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I, had one, I had one daughter at the time. Um, uh, and I went there, and, and then she got pregnant and had a second daughter. <laughs> and I got orders for, for Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I think I'd been there probably at, uh, probably about, 15, 16 months, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I brought, she wanted to come back to Maryland. So this was, that was probably 65 when you got it those orders? It was uh, late 65, yeah. Late 65, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, she wanted to come back here to Maryland because she grew up right here in Maryland, um, right in Howard County. <clears throat> um, so I brought her and my two daughters back here. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at that time they were probably the youngest one was probably about just short of one year old. Mm -hmm. The other one was two going on three, something like that. Anyway, I can't remember exactly what it was. Right. And I, I took 30 days vacation, went to visit all my family here, and flew into San Francisco. Uh, thought I was headed to Vietnam. When I, when I walk in the airport, they're paging me when I walk. This is a regular commercial airport right, right there in San Francisco. They're paging me when I walk in. And who the heck knows I'm out here, <laughs> except for the Army. So it's got to be the Army. The Army page, the only other person knew it, my wife. I had nothing happened to her since I just flew out here. Right. Report to the Army repo desk. And I report down there, and they said, you're not going to Vietnam right away. You're headed to Hawaii. I'm a complete surprise. Right. Yeah. He said, don't smile. You, I can see you got a little smile. <laughs> you, 
You're still going. <laughs> You're just going to go by way of Hawaii. You're going to join the 25th Infantry Division. Oh, that's right. They Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. Right. Mm -hmm. So they already got all the equipment, everything boxed up, packed up, sitting at the docks, waiting for the word to move. You may be there three days a week. Well, I was actually there four months. Wow. Yeah. As deployments go, you know, that's the, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, rem and I remember calling my wife. Oh, she wasn't happy. <laughs> she definitely wasn't happy. <laughs> in Hawaii. <laughs> I'm the, I am in Hawaii. Uh, so well, I called her about two, three, I said, I'm only going to be here for a few days. And I called her back about three, four days. She said, you're still there? <laughs> Well, I called her back the next day before she said, before you say anything, uh, I just want to tell you, pick me up at the Hawaii International Airport. I'm, I'm flying in tomorrow at 2.30. <laughs> so she left our, left our two children with her parents, and she was going to be out there for a week. Oh. She stayed for almost three, three, four weeks until oh, her mother finally called and said, <laughs> come on back here and get your children. Mm -hmm. But that was my introduction to heading, and about four months later, I left by ship headed to Vietnam. Wow. And that was, that was a real rude awakening. Mm -hmm. um, Did you get to train with your uh, battery and everything when you were there in Hawaii before that, or were they everything all boxed well, we up? We did a lot of yet? training, but not with, the, well, not with any of the equipment, because all that was all packed up right. sitting at the docks. Yeah, where did you go? So we were running around out there on the, on, on the reservation at Schofield Barracks, right. taking different types of training. Right, yeah. Um, CBR, CB, no, the gas training right. and stuff mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So I didn't have it. I didn't have much of an introduction. That's the, that's the, all the introduction I had to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. it's just a little bit of training we had at uh, at Schofield Barracks. Right. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't in a uh, a regular battery. Well, I was. I don't know how much you know about field artillery. Yeah. I, mean, I guess it's still probably the same. Hasn't mm -hmm. changed much. Mm -hmm. I was in the division artillery headquarters. Oh, okay, right. Uh, mm -hmm. And they weren't used to second lieutenants. They ne they never had lieutenants assigned. It. They're all yeah, they're first either. lieutenants, captains. Some very few first lieutenants. Yeah, probably captain, captain. Most of captains and majors and, majors and lieutenant colonels. And E sevens and E eights. Yeah, and, and, yeah, yeah, high ranks. Yeah, uh, but they they stocked up the units with larger numbers than what they were what the, what the table organizations called for at that right. time. So they had four of us there, four second lieutenants. Uh -huh. Our job was, we were supposed to be aerial observers. Uh, and that was our primary function. And then we were supposed to be replacement forward observers for any of the, any of the battalions who lost it. Lost it in. Well, mm -hmm. If you know anything about field artillery, forward observers are You're right up very front. vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely vulnerable. Yeah. So, yeah. That's, so that was, we were supposed to be replacements until they could get and a, you know, a new replacement is if they lost one of the lieutenants in some of the uh, actual right. infantry and army battalions. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So that's what I did when I went over there. Mm -hmm. But uh, the strange thing about it, we went over by ship, and uh, we sat there, and we got there, and we sat there for about two days right there on the ship before, the, before we disembarked. Oh, wow. And they got us prepared as if we were going to storm the beaches. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. Gave us live mm -hmm. ammunition while we're sitting there. Right. We came off, off down the side of the ship, went on LSTs with the packs on our backs, and and I I think we're I'm think I'm picturing D Day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't know any better. Hey. <laughs> this was uh, uh, this was what summer fall. This was 66? probably late December, uh, early. I can't well, I, went, I think I went late December the first tour. Right, in 66? 65. 65, yeah. okay, okay. Uh, no, no, I couldn't have been. It had to be 66. 66. I spent four months there, so it'd probably be early 60, 66. Okay, okay. Uh, we moved the entire brigade from the from Schofield Barracks over there mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. in the Division okay. Artillery Headquarters. Uh, we came on the beach, and I no sooner got one foot out of the water on the beach, and they're standing there waiting for him. We got a mission for you. And, I, and what did, we came into one of the most uh, Vietnam, Vietnam resort centers. Oh, okay. And oh, there's wow. all these Vietnamese women. I mean, they're all over it, in bathing attire. And, <laughs> and, and I, I think we're storming the beach. <laughs> anyway, I wasn't there for five minutes. Walked up on the land. They said, report to operations. I don't know where operations I just got off. I'm still wet, man. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, 
get on that Jeep. They'll take you down there. I, before I even got out of the Jeep, said, you see that helicopter? Now go get on it. I never even <laughs> let you go get on the helicopter. We got a mission. They'll tell you what your mission is. Mm. So I get on the helicopter and the pilot says, I have no idea what you mean. I'm supposed to take you to Coochie. Well, I knew, I knew that's where our home base was, but I'd never been there. I had no idea where it was. Right. An hour and a half later, a helicopter lands in Coochie, and there's the lieutenant colonel, the operations officer, standing there waiting for me. He hands me a map, says, there's your Jeep and driver, and gives me a set of coordinates, says, report to a major. I gave him this major's name, of course. That's, that's been 40 years. I can't even remember his name. Right, right. yeah. That's all I knew. I said, aren't you going to give me a briefing, an orientation? Go. You're late now. <laughs> so, well, I'm navigating down these little dirt country roads scared to death because I, I didn't even have time to get oriented. I, I figured the Viet Cong going to step out of, those, out of one of those rice paddies. Mm. But I finally found this little town down there. It's got to be close to somewhere. Guess what? It's a Vietnamese regiment. I don't speak Vietnamese, but that's what I was. I was, I was attached to a advisory team. So you were in an advisory role then as soon as you well, got there. Well, wow. my mission, I was supposed to provide them artillery support from U.S. units. That's why I was there. Right, okay. So I was attached to a five-man advisory team. Those were the only Americans there. All the rest of them were Vietnamese. Mm. Uh, and he, when I walked in, he says, Lieutenant, you're late. You were supposed to have been here yesterday. And I said, well, that's the way the Army is. I just got here in country today. And he said, uh, have you been briefed? Do you know where we're going? I said, I have nothing. All I was told is report to you, and you're going to give me the briefing. And he said, I don't know what the heck to tell you about artillery. That's what you're here for. And he said, we're leaving in 15 minutes. So the whole regiment packed up and moved out. I went with them. Didn't know where I was going. Didn't know where any of the artillery units were. Didn't know anything. Mm. But so I got on the radio and started calling, calling back, uh, got all the information I could over the radio. They encoded the units and told me where they were and this kind of stuff. But that's the kind of stuff I should have gotten in the briefing the first. That was my introduction to Vietnam. Right. Within an hour and a half, two hours after I set foot in Vietnam, I was on a mission with the Vietnamese, <laughs> with the Vietnamese regiment. <laughs> but it tur that turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm. But these other three lieutenants, they had all they did for those three months, they were back at Coochie. They came by convoy. It took them a day and a half to get there by convoy. And all they had been doing was filling sandbags and supervising that kind of stuff, doing all this for the whole month. I was out there with the, with the Vietnamese for, right. for, for a month. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, I didn't think I was going to survive it. Yeah, it was, it was tough. It was mm -hmm. hot. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were fighting the whole time we were out there. Mm. Uh, but I survived it. Right. Um, Did you have a, a non-commissioned officer with you, chief of smoke or anything like that? Oh, no. That chief, chief of smoke in the artillery, he's the, he's the senior NCO in charge of the guns. He's in charge of guns. Yeah. So, I mean, somebody... No, I, had a, I had a sergeant, an E-5. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, called, he was called a reconnaissance sergeant. It okay. was him, him and I and my driver. We, that's right. it. That's, that makes up the, the Florida artillery team. Now, was he, was that Sergeant E-5, was he experienced? No, he was brand new, too. Oh, my goodness. Wow. So... <laughs> So we were both brand new. Yeah, um, he didn't. He didn't know any more than I did. Mm -hmm. um, the the biggest thing I remember more than getting shot at and almost getting killed is I for a whole month. Guess what we ate? Rice, three meals a day. Not sea rations. Not oh, with that's because you were with the not Vietnamese. with the Vietnamese. That's you're eating their, their The their advisory rations. team had to eat what they ate, oh, and since goodness. I was attached to them, I had to eat what they. I, if I'd have known that before I got there, I'd have took taken some sea rations with me, but. <laughs> Didn't even know that at the time. Uh, uh, and I got so sick of those, uh, those damn sea rations. They'd they yeah. boil it and boil it until they boiled it into a paste uh -huh. and roll it into a big bowl and put it in a cellophane bag and they carry it on the, on the belt, draped over a cellophane bag. And they give you these little packets of condiments and Flavoring. flavorings and right. different stuff. I flavored that stuff all I could. That, even to this day, I don't eat rice hardly at all because that whole month just cured me eating rice. But, so while I was out, we got close to the American unit, and I told told that major, I said, "I'll be back." I mean, he said, "Where are you?" I said, "I don't worry, I'll be back." I'm, I went down this grounds up about four cases of sea rations okay. from this American unit, and brought them back, and he said, "You know, you're not supposed to be doing that. You're supposed to be eating with the Vietnamese." And I said, "Well, I, I'm not an advisor." And he said, "I'll take one of those cases." Oh, did he? <laughs> He wanted him as well. So I gave, yeah. yeah, I gave him one. But 
Uh, so that was my my introduction to Vietnam. It mm -hmm. was it was crazy. Right. That was early in the war, and they they just didn't take time to train us. Yeah. They'd give us an orientation and all. Thrown right into it and everything. So, um, and then how long were you uh, in that advisory role? Uh, about six, seven months, maybe. Okay. Something like six, a little over six months. Uh -huh. uh, I spent the rest of it. Oh, it's very inter interesting. I had a. Uh, this is one of the negative things about being in the military at the time. I had a real problem. My, my boss was a lieutenant colonel. He didn't particularly care for me. Well, I met him when we were in Hawaii. I came back from that being attached to that Vietnamese regiment for a month, and I just wanted to get cleaned up and take a shower and had a little makeshift officer's club there. I just want to have a couple of beers. I'm in there taking a, taking a shower and just get into the officer's club, I down by one beer, report to operations. Same night, I just got back. So I go in and report to him, and we got another mission for you. Five o'clock in the morning, be ready to go. And I just got back. Lieutenant, be here five o'clock in the morning. You're, you're going on another mission. Well, this time they sent me out to an, an infantry battalion. 27th Infantry, 1st or 27th, I think it was. Wolfhounds is what they call themselves. Mm. They'd lost one of their lieutenants, forward observers, and that's what our job was. We're supposed to be replacements until they get another one. So I went out there. And it seemed like, I said, boy, it seemed like whoever I go with is in deep trouble here. <laughs> <laughs> we lost half that company I was attached to. Uh, after, after you joined the unit, they, you still had, you were still in con contact and everything, and you, and you had casualties and everything? Yeah, well, they sent me out there right. as a replacement for observer. Normally, the forward observers are permanently attached to them, right. so they yeah. stay with them all the time. Well, they needed one. I came in as a replacement, temporarily. Didn't even know anybody in that battalion. Mm -hmm. uh, battalion commander says, report out there to the forward company. <laughs> Told me what the coordinates were. They said, they're under attack right now. They need field artillery support, so <laughs> there I went. Uh, for three days, we battled, battled, and, I, and then they got a mission to go re, go secure a helicopter. A big Chinook had gone down mm -hmm. 10 miles north of us. We got permission to go secure it. And we had a hell of a time getting to that thing. Hey, we got ambushed three or four times en route to this thing. And this is a, this is an entire company. Uh, it was, we were up near the Cambodian border, and of course, whenever you got near the Cambodian border, it got terrible because they'd come across the border and they'd run right back, they'd right. Run, attack you, and they'd run back across the border. They right. knew we wouldn't follow them across mm. the border. Uh, one of the bad things about being in that type of war. Mm. Uh, so when we finally got to that helicopter that night, we secured it for that night, uh, and we were under attack the whole time, all night long. They were trying to get, the, they wanted to destroy the helicopter. Mm. They finally came in the next morning and lifted that thing out of there, and I was I was happy to get out of there. Right. See, H-54 uh, come and lift it out? Yeah, they came in. There was oh, another right. one that lifted it and took oh, it out of there. Oh, my goodness. Uh, um, but they had the mechanics in there working on it all night long, trying to get that thing running. I don't know what this problem was. I didn't have time to worry about it. I was, I was busy keeping <laughs> artillery fire around the place the whole time I was there. Right. Um, so Did I was, you call the missions in? Over the radio, or did you have an RTO call the missions? No, I had, that's that's what my driver did. He, 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 he was on the radio. On the radio, yeah, you, he was on the radio. You had the map and the coordinates, and, and I everything. just Plotting. just gave him, and he called it in. Right. Okay. So okay. then I just, uh -huh. um, and sometimes I put my E5 on the on the radio, depending on from where we were. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But um, I came back after that. Same thing happened. I wasn't even back for. I cleaned up and I had about three beers. I was going to get drunk. <laughs> uh, Been in Vietnam for six months and only had four beers. I mean, what's the deal? <laughs> I hadn't even had time to unpack my stuff yet. My stuff is still packed up, stuffed in the corner. <laughs> Got another mission for you in the morning. If I be here at five o'clock in the morning, always five o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And I'm saying, wait a minute now. I have. Anyway, to make a long, long story short here, I said, I'm going to get drunk. I'll be, I'll be there at 5, but I'm going to get drunk tonight. Uh, I'm sitting there half drunk, and here comes this warrant officer. The only other black officer there, they had in the whole division, we were the only two. Uh, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, <clears throat> says to me, he says, you don't, you don't know what they're doing to you. And I said, what are they doing? He said, there's three other lieutenants just like you. They haven't been anywhere yet. You're about to go on your third mission. And oh, well, you got to be kidding me. No, no, they haven't been anywhere. All they've been doing is supervising sandbagging and building up bunkers and stuff. I said, well, wait a minute now. So I said, I, I got to bring this up. So I went, went down there to see the colonel. And I walked in. He said, Lieutenant, you're drunk. And I said, yes, sir, I am. But I got a question for you. <laughs> I understand these other three lieutenants haven't been anywhere. And I'm about ready to go out again. And he said, are you questioning me? And I said, well, <laughs> the lieutenants don't question colonels. Right. I said, well, I guess if you put it that, <laughs> put it that way, I guess I am. He said, I told you to be here at 5 o'clock. That's the end of this discussion. And you know, I said, well, am I going to make an issue out of this, or am I going to just go on out there? And I started to walk out, and I said, hey, I might get my butt killed out here if I go on another mission. So I said, yeah, I need an answer. I said, I'm not going anywhere until I get an answer. Well, it, it's, that got rather nasty. I'll just, just leave that right there. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Uh, he put me on, on sus- whatever. Yeah, I was going to put on charges for the- anyway. oh, well. I was half drunk. I knew it at the time. Right. I shouldn't have done it, but I did it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I didn't go anywhere for three days. Put me up on charges. So I'll, I'll leave that. But it, I, I got out of it. Yeah. Beat it. Beat the charges. <laughs> and, and then I had to report to the division artillery commander. Now, he's a full colonel. Right. Yeah. And he said, all right, we've decided not, we're not going to charge you. Uh, we're going to send you back to on that, on that mission that you were supposed to go on, but you need to report back to the same lieutenant colonel that I had a problem with. I said, no, wait, are you going to send me right back to the same individual we had this problem with before? Uh, his only response was, lieutenant, if you're going to be in this man's army, you need to learn how to deal with these kind of situations. Right. All right. Well, I need to say, he wasn't very happy when I reported back to see him. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, I, won't, I won't go into the discussion we had, but I was happy to get out of there. Mm-hmm. They sent me down to the Armored Cavalry Squadron mm-hmm. this time. Uh, and that was great. Because those guys, I don't, if you know anything about Armored Cavalry Squadrons, those guys are... Crazy. Uh, yeah, they are. They're crazy. And, and, but they're... They don't have time for all that kind of nonsense right. that they had back then. The division, they are fighting. They're right, mission oriented. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I went to B Troop. B Troop. Uh, combination of tanks and and. Uh, what regiment was that? 11, I think it was 11th Army Cavalry. 11th ACR. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, again, my memory's getting bad, but mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it was 11th Army Cavalry Squadron. Mm-hmm. And they normally don't have forward observers, so, but there I am as a forward observer, mm-hmm. uh, working with the B Troop commander. And here, here's one of the big blessings you run into in the Army at the time. I, I wound up working with B Troop, and they, got, they have four port tube mortars, organic right. to their yeah. use. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that at the time, but that's, they have a little bit of everything in that Army Cover Squad. They were one, mounted in 113s, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they were using them for ash and trash and police calls, and, and they weren't even using them for anything. And of course, you know, when you do that, the morale is terrible. Right. Most 4.2. Mm-hmm. If if you weren't armored in the armored cavalry squad, and you were <laughs> less than that. So that's what that's the way they treated them. Yeah. yeah. Well, they were they were uh, eleven Charlies, right? They weren't. They, I, they weren't or were they 19? nineteen? I don't deltas? know what the MOS were. Nineteen Deltas, so the scout, 4. and eleven 2. Charlie is an infantry mortarman. They probably were eleven Charlies, and they were assigned to. Uh, well, that, to the, they were to probably the infantry mortarmen if that's yeah. that what their MOS was. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, we went out. Their mission was early morning. They had to clear the roads, all the roads, all the way from base camp, all the way to Saigon, mm-hmm. ninety miles. They had to clear it, make sure it was cleared. Uh, so that's what we did. We went out and did that several times. And then we went out on several other missions uh, in the middle of rubber plantations up there. And he sa- his troop commander says, can you do anything with my 4.2 crews? You're, you're an artilleryman. You should be able to work with these guys. So I went, I did. I said, well, I'll see what I can do with them. Well, I found out very quickly the whole problem was their morale was terrible. Right. 
So I said, all right, I, can, I told him, I said, I can train these guys, but I tell you, you're not going to get much out of them until you start treating them properly. They're part of your unit just like the rest of these people. You need to treat them that way. Mm. He listened to me. Their 4.2s within, the, I was there for about three weeks, three, four weeks. I had them. They were working great. Yeah. They, they were afraid to even use them because they couldn't hit up the broad side of a bar with those things. Never knew where they were going to land when they fired them. Mm. And he told me, he said, you, you've done an excellent job with these. I said, you did the, you did it, but you stopped treating them like they're second class citizens. <laughs> so mm. I'm, I'm supposed to report back to my Devardi headquarters. I didn't want to go back up there with that Lieutenant Colonel. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, boot troop commander says, before you go, the squadron commander wants to talk to you. Well, I had never met the squadron commander at the 11th Army Cavalry Squadron. Mm. He's a full colonel. Right. I didn't know what, I said, well, what's he want to see me for? He said, he'll tell you when you get there. So I went to see him, and he's, make that story short, he said, I understand you're the one who's trained these 4.2s in B Troop. Well, yes, sir, I did. He said, can you do that for the rest of the squadron? Uh, I said, sure, if you'll listen to me, if you stop treating them like second class citizens, yeah, I can get them ready. I said, but I'm supposed to report back to my headquarters. They've already issued me orders to come back. Well, then the 11th Arbor Convoy Squad, he gets whatever he wants. Right, yeah. He said, don't worry about that. You're going to stay right here. Mm -hmm. You can report back up there, but you're, you're coming back. <laughs> so I, did, I went up there, uh, and when I reported to my lieutenant colonel, he says, who do you know? Well, to make that story short. Mm -hmm. uh, I, like, you got you to learn how to do these kind of things if you're going to survive in the military. I, I played dumb. I didn't know anything. Right. Well, the 11th ACR commander calls the Devardi, who goes yeah. 06 to 06, yeah. colonels talking exactly to each other and everything. He says, hey, he probably knows him. Knows him. They knows him by knows first name and everything. Man, and say, yeah. hey, I want Lieutenant Hollingsworth to stay down here with me and everything. He says, you got him. So I went, I went back down there, and I stayed there for the next up to six months. Wow. Mm -hmm. Stayed down there. I didn't want to go back to Division Army headquarters. You didn't know all that mess. Mm -hmm. Well, it was eight years later, nine years, I went to Germany. And the division commander, Third Army Division, I reported Third. That's who it was. The colonel. That oh, served. the Eleventh ACR commander yeah. had gotten promoted to be mm -hmm. the division commander. He's now a two-star general, oh commanding the Third Army Division. Right. And I reported in as a, I think I was probably a major, or on the list of major. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I had a computer specialist, specialist, and I trained the computers. And the Army says, you're not, going to, you're not doing computers when you go to 3rd Army Division. You're going into a field artillery assignment. Right. So I report in. The Chief of Staff says, you're, we're gonna, we can't change your orders. You've got to go down to a field artillery unit. He said, but I'm going to send you in to see the general uh, before we send you down there. Because he might try to keep you here for your computer experience up here at Division Headquarters. Hmm. I had no idea who the Division Commander was. I just got that. Right. Uh, so I, I, I normally don't do that. Maybe you come a new officer coming in, you don't see the division commander. But right. I, maybe the chief of staff, but certainly yeah, not. Yeah, chief of staff. I saw general, yeah. So he sent me. I walked in, and reported to the general, and he he looks at me, and I looked at him, and he said, "Don't I know you? Have you served with me somewhere before?" And I looked at him, and I said, "Yeah, I think I do know you." Yeah, that's who he was. He was the colonel in charge of Lambert Campus Square. Isn't that a kick? Yeah, <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah. So he said, you can, you can go down to that battalion. I, can't, I guess I can't change your orders, but I, he said, whatever the time limit is you have, that you're going to be back up here running my computers up mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. so, well, it was probably a year. They needed to get your branch qualified <laughs> as a field artillery major. Field, uh, That's exactly what it was. Uh, I was down there as, a, as an executive officer, a field right, yeah. uh, 8-inch battalion uh -huh, uh -huh. for a year, and then I came back up to division artillery headquarters, I mean, division headquarters right. to run that computer center. What division was that? Third Army Division in Third Germany. Third Army Division. Frankfurt, Germany. Okay, in Frankfurt, okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but back to Vietnam, right. after six months, I then went down and commanded, a, I mean, not commanded, as an executive officer. I got promoted to first lieutenant, mm. and I was executive officer of an eight-inch uh, battery. Mm -hmm. uh, were those self-propelled? Yeah, inch? those self-propelled oh, eight-inch. Wow. Mm. Uh, and we moved, we, I got there one day, and we moved the entire battery up to Tain In, which was about I had, I mean, maybe 100, some 100, 150 miles northwest of Kuchi, mm -hmm. up up near the camp, right on the Cambodian border. Mm. And there's where I got into a real big battle. Uh, I, I had, to, I always took two guns out, just two guns and 
normally we were trained to move the entire battery as a unit, but there we had to take two guns on missions. Mm -hmm. uh, and my battery commander, he was a very unusual guy at that time. All he was worried about was getting medals. He always wanted to be a, put himself in the hot spot, so wherever the thing where he thought it was a hot spot. And every time he'd send me somewhere with two guns as executive officer, I wound up in the hot spots. <laughs> So he was all very unhappy with me. He said, every time I send you out, you wind up in all these hot spots. And I but sent me up there, a little, right up there, and they, there's a little mountain, perfectly flat land for all around there for 200 miles, but there's a little mountain right there. <laughs> like it just popped up out of nowhere. Yeah. I was sitting right at the base of that thing with an infantry platoon for security. Um, and by the time that operation was over, we were completely surrounded by three divisions. Oh my goodness. We fired continuously at one point for three days, never stopped, round the clock, just kept firing, kept firing, kept firing. Mm -hmm. And by the time that whatever that particular, so, I was so darn tired, and my, my gun crews, there were, so we were rotating them, trying to get a little bit of sleep, but I was the only officer out there. So I could, I had, <laughs> I had to stay awake the whole time. I catch little cat naps. Right. By the time we finished firing, that place looked like a pigsty, um, with canisters, canisters uh, excess all over canisters, the place and right. powder. And we didn't have time to clean it. We just kept firing around the clock. Right. Um, and I was so damn tired of sleep. I said, "Go to sleep, sleep, sleep for a while. We'll clean up this place when we after we wake up." So I climbed underneath the firing charts. In the, in the fire direction center, draped the blanket over it, block out the light, because they had somebody on duty the whole time. Sound asleep, and the next thing I know, here comes, says a colonel wants to see you out there. And you gotta remember, in the early part of the war, it was the company officers, company grade and below that were fighting. The higher ups were back at the, the main camp and mm -hmm. cots, Saigon and stuff, they'd fly out in the helicopters and when they started getting dark, they'd go back. Yeah. So we were, out, you, we were out there the whole time. Right. And that's what they were doing. So I, I didn't know who this colonel was. He came in, he was upset because our place looked like a pigsty. Right. Oh, he jumps all over me. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, sir, I'm trying to explain to him, we've been fine <laughs> continuously for three days. Uh, Anyway, I, I guess I didn't handle that very well either. Mm -hmm. uh, so he, he, next thing I know, I get a call from my battery commander. I'm, I'm coming out there to replace you. Uh, you stepped in it this time. I didn't even know what the heck he's talking about. I was half, still half asleep, this guy jumping all over me. <laughs> anyway, uh, but we finally, I got, we finally out, we cleaned the place up, got it all straight. And I, and I, the next morning he comes out there by helicopter and says, you can go back to, back to take charge of the rest of the battery back there. I was happy to leave. <laughs> I'm tired, man. Uh, I, second time now, it's still my first time. I'm on charges again. Oh this colonel, colonel went back and to my battalion commander, back, all the way back to Coochie, put me up on charges again. Um, you, I'm, of course, I'm back at our base camp. We're for the entire battery back there, taking in. And uh, here comes my battalion commander. He comes in by helicopter. The whole unit was just coming back from this operation by this time. Mm -hmm. They were pulling in, and the battery commander comes up in and gets me. And he, I walk up there. There's my battalion commander, battery commander. There. They're they're about ready to read me the charges, and here comes another helicopter at the same time. Um, lands in the first side, met it. Comes in. He comes in and says, "Sir, there's a." Lieutenant Colonel wants to see Lieutenant Hollingsworth. I think it was. Well, you, you it was. You got every it, Lieutenant Colonel in Vietnam after well, you. Huh? <laughs> this time, we, this was the, the chat. We'd saved them. With those two guns I had out there, he, he came and he's going to print a brown star on me. Oh, really? He said, if it hadn't been for you guys and those two guns were firing around the clock, we, they would, we would never made it. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, so he's there to congratulate So he's there you. to congratulate me and tell me he's going to pin a brown star on me. Well, my battalion man didn't know how to deal with that. <laughs> uh, he uh, said, all right, well, we, we need to suspend this up until. So he does. He comes up. He pins a brown star on me. Wow. Incredible. Right there, he, and uh, he pinned the Brian Star on all my, the two gun chiefs I had, and the chief Ryan Bradley, he was out there with me, uh, pinned on all, all of us. 
Incredible. Well, they like that eight inch. That eight oh, inch is yeah, a big that, round. That, that eight big inch round comes in, it makes a, a big boom. Big, huge. <laughs> yeah, that's a big, huge round. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's, a, it's a very accurate, one of the most accurate weapons they had. I don't know, like, probably is still one of the oh, most really? accurate weapons they had. Uh, Dropped uh -huh. that thing on a dime. Really? Um, wow. Sure. Uh -huh. uh, so I had to report back to battalion headquarters back at Coochie. Uh, my battalion commander said, you're going you're gonna to charge you this time. Um, and the net result was he said, well, you need to learn how to talk to superior officers and I, didn't, I had no plans of staying in the Army. I I'm just trying to do the best I can, trying to get the job done the best right. I can. Mm -hmm. And I, I just thought that was kind of called for. He'd drop out of the sky and jump all over. He don't even know what the situation is. He jumps all right. over me, jumps all over my chief firing battery. Uh, anyway, I'll leave that alone. <laughs> uh, he's my battalion commander says, it looks like you've escaped again. Uh, this colonel is getting very upset that we're going to charge you. Well, for something silly like that. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, but I stayed there as executive officer of that battery until I came home. And mm -hmm. after yeah, six months as a uh, division artillery headquarters and uh, six months as an uh, executive officer of a firing mm -hmm. battery. So it was one year. One whole year. One whole year tour that you were yeah. over there and everything. And uh, of course, I told this story. I spoke at the senior center yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, they had to send it their veterans program. I told this story yesterday about coming home from Vietnam. I didn't know what was going on back here. Uh, my wife right to me all the time. She never told me anything about what was going on back here. The protesting. Yeah, and the protests like and right. people all upset and they had the people running off to Canada and trying to avoid the draft. Mm -hmm. I came in and I don't know what I expected, but I didn't expect what I got. Uh, got off the... Travis Air Force Base. I came and the plane was leaving, late leaving, and I was supposed to have a connecting flight at O'Hare in Chicago. We missed the connecting flight. So I'm sitting there. I had to sit there all night. Now, mm. That didn't make me too happy because I'm trying to get back to yeah, my right, family. Right, I'm kidding, anxious yeah. to get home. And I got to spend the night sitting in the airport. Mm. I'm sitting there minding my business. Here comes four hippies, I guess. Give me a hard time. Give me, give me, call me a baby killer and uh, go back to Vietnam. And, uh, well, I, I saw this stuff all over the place. I thought I'd come into a foreign country or something. Wow. Uh, mm. uh, then I get to um, Ronald Reagan Airport. It wasn't, wasn't, wasn't Ronald Reagan at yeah, that na time. National, National, National Airport. Airport, right. And when I, pull it, I come down the ramp, and there's my wife sitting there with my two daughters. Uh, and my two little girls, they were running all over the place, running around there. My wife's trying to keep calm. You know, keep and as I walked up to them, they both stopped. Didn't know what to make of me coming up to them. And my oldest daughter, I saw her. She sit down on a chair. Of course, I'm hugging my wife, kissing my wife. And uh, after doing I, I looked at my youngest daughter who was standing. I went to pick her up. She ran from me. <laughs> Wouldn't even come near me. She didn't know who Red, you were. hid behind them. She didn't know who I was. That's a whole year. <laughs> right. Yeah. She didn't have a focus idea who I was. Yeah. So I'd both turn looking at my oldest daughter. She's sitting there in the chair looking at me, trying to make out who this is. I could see it in her face. She could she was old enough when I left. She just barely remembered me, but she wasn't too sure <laughs> after mm. a year. She kept looking at me. And I said to her, I remember saying to her, Rodney, Rodney don't you know who I am? And she and all of a sudden, her face light lit up. She's dead. <laughs> she remembered. <laughs> oh yeah, she yeah. finally she jumped out of the chair, jumped in my arms. Uh -huh. And I look back. She's hugging and kissing. I look back at my youngest daughter. She doesn't know how to make of this now. Her mother's hugging, kissing on this strange man. Now her sister's hugging and kissing on this man. She don't know who that guy is. <laughs> it took me about three weeks. I finally won her over. I won her over. And everything. <laughs> Good. But that was my first year experience, experience right. in Vietnam. Uh -huh. I may have taken a lot of time, but I wanted to get a few things out about that. Right. Uh, uh, but then we're... Getting close to an hour. Okay. Well, it's been an hour. I've been running my mouth that much for an hour. About 40 minutes. Okay. How much more tape do you have? A bit, but... Okay. I mean, give it a... What, what I'd like to do, what I'd like to do is have you talk about the, uh, the John McCain story. 
over in uh, over in Vietnam. Oh, well, and this was this yeah. would be your second tour. This is my second tour. You yeah. were how how long were you? You came back to the states, and how long were you in the yeah, states before I you went got to back to Fort Sill? Uh -huh. um, and uh, I was there for two, three years, three years, I think. Yeah, three years. Three years. Got promoted to captain. And went back to Vietnam. I, in, 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 in the interim, I got a, a involuntarily extended for 18 months. I was supposed to get out at the end of, end of right. my first tour. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't let me out. You're going to stay for 18, 18 more months. They needed officers. Yeah. Um, so they sent me back to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, and I was now and then a battery commander this time. Right. 155 split trails. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. uh, out there on a fire base. Um, had Navy personnel, 22 Navy personnel, the Air Force personnel, and so air defense all on my fire base. I'm bad enough with my unit, but I got all these extra people out there on the fire wow. base. Uh -huh. So we got some, they selected my fire base for what was, I guess it was the same job that these, this commanding general had when he was in Afghanistan and Iraq, and the guy that was in charge of all the Navy, Army, Army uh, military forces in the area. Right. Some, I forget, something, something Pacific or whatever okay. it was. Right. Well, that was John McCain's father. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, he was an admiral. Yeah, Navy. Ad, Navy admiral. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going on tour of Vietnam, and he, he wanted to see several, several different places. They picked my unit, right. to the fire base I was on. Well, that's because you had the Navy personnel there, so that yeah, was but, probably a connection, probably. you know, yeah. to come and check out some uh, of those Navy guys. So, yeah, when you're in the military, whenever you have someone like that coming, there's always a big color balloon. Everybody, they drive you crazy. Right, because he was a four-star admiral at that point, yeah, right? At that time, yeah, yes. So four stars, that gets a lot of attention. <laughs> yeah. So everybody's coming in. I'm, I'm Admiral McCain. Take me through your tour. For two weeks prior, I had to take these people through the tour and what I was going to say to them. And everybody's saying, don't mention his son. I don't know what the heck they're talking about. So... And, Finally, the, the, the division manager comes in, and he says the same thing. Don't mention his son. So I turned to the sergeant major, and I, I, think, I said, what has his son got to do with me and taking this man on a tour? And he said, he said oh, you don't, know, you don't know his son's a prisoner of war. Said, well, I didn't, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody, if you dare mention his son, and you bring up his son, we're, you're going to be deep, deep trouble. <laughs> when he leaves, I, I, think, I kind of bring up somebody I don't even know about. Anyway, so I'm I'm escorting him around through the fire base and showing him some things. And he he looks he stops and looks at me and he says he says it. He said, "Yeah, you remind me of my son. I guess you're about the same age." Uh, and he started talking about his son. Uh, and he said, "You don't know my." I said, "Well, he said I guess you don't know him because he's in the Navy." Uh, and while he's standing there talking, he got tears in his eyes. Um, I didn't know what to, what to say. All these, all these other people are standing back behind us. They don't, they don't, I, he and I talking, they couldn't hear what we were saying. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, then he, of course, being a Navy Admiral, he pulled himself together and stood back up and he said, he said, forgive me, I, he's been a prisoner of war for a number of years. I don't, and it, I don't think I'll, I may not ever see him again. Oh, wow. Um, uh, uh -huh. He said, but you, you're about the same age as he is. I found out later, he's four or five years older than I am. Mm -hmm. um, but he said, you're about the same age, you remind me of him. And then he says, when, when are you going home? Well, I had about six more months to go before I was going home. He said, he, he, said, he gave me a phone number. He said, contact me when you, when you get back to the States. Well, I had never met this Navy Admiral before. I'm in the Army, he's in the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> he gave me a phone number. He said, call me when you get back. Right. Well, I didn't quite know how to take that. Mm -hmm. well, he, well, okay. So then he gets, they get on their helicopter. And oh, man, everybody jumps all over me. You brought up his son. I didn't bring him up. He did. Uh, but that's, uh -huh. that's how I met him. Right. Uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And when I came back, he was down at the Pentagon. Right. Uh, so I went, to, I called him. Called him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my wife and I went to see him, and we we had a we had a great time over this house. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he called me. He called me after John McCain got released. Uh, he invited. He was having a big thing over there. He called me. Invited. Invited to come over there. Right. And this was down in Northern Virginia. Yeah, Northern Virginia. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
<laughs> and my wife says, what do you, what? you don't even know that Navy Admiral. I said, well, hey. <laughs> Never hurts to get to know somebody right. in that stature. There must have been immediate, uh, you know, connection there when yeah. you were giving him, the, you know, the tour of the base and everything like that. Yeah, you know, I, it was, there. I was surprised, but yeah. he said, "Yeah, you, remi you remind me of my son." Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. But that's how, that's how I met him. That's, that's I still got those pictures. I got pictures of him of, of, that were taken when we were taking him on that tour. Oh, his, really? His father, yeah. Oh, no kidding! Wow. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think the connection was, like I said, you know, the Navy guys that were on that base, since you had that, you know, they wanted to kind of yeah. just draw there to see how they were, you know, how they were working and being traded. And I guess they were for uh, naval gunfire. Is that what they were? No, they had a gunfire? they had a big, huge airstrip. Uh, oh, okay. The Air Force and the Navy manned that airstrip right down the bottom of the hill where we were sitting. I see. Okay. And at night, of course, everything happened over there at night. They yeah. they'd come up and and secure for security on on my fire base. Right. So that's where they were staying on our fire base. I see. Um, and then in the morning, they'd go back down in the fire and man that airfield. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, thanks for coming out. I appreciate it, Ron, uh, you know, uh, coming up here to talk to us today and everything. If you had uh, any words of wisdom to kind of impart to uh, people about, you know, your time in the military, being a veteran, younger people looking to go into the military or anything like that, what would you like to? Uh, oh, yeah, I, I, words of wisdom. If you if you want to go in the military, even if you don't want to, if you if you don't have any experience doing anything, and you look, that's the place to go. You, but you need to go and take advantages, take advantage of the opportunities you have to get trained. Mm -hmm. I came out of the army; they trained me in computers. I walked right out of the army, walked right into the corporate world as a computer specialist. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I did did about eight ten years, mostly computers. Um, so, but a lot of people go in the military, whether it's Navy, Army, or what, they, they don't take advantage of what's available for them. Mm -hmm. If you do that when you go in the military, you, you'll set yourself up in life right. for the rest of your career. Uh -huh. I was 42 when I retired from the Army, and I went right back to work mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as a computer specialist in the corporate world. Right. Uh -huh. uh, so that's the advice I'd give to you. It's a great place to get trained. Right. Uh -huh. They will train. They will definitely train you if you'll take advantage of it. Right. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming <coughs> out, Ron. We really appreciate it uh, for the Carroll History Project, and uh, I'll look forward to many more hours talking with you over at the American Legion. Appreciate it. Uh, it was a pleasure.